All right, so starting off here in Acts chapter 17, we see um, this is after Paul and, um, and Barnabas split up, right? Paul takes Silas and, and Barnabas. And so what they're doing is they're making a circuit. They're going around and they're checking back up on, on the churches that they had started previously. So they're going to say, hey, let's go and check this up. So here we see in, in uh, chapter 17, now they come to, they go through a few places and they end up in Thessalonica. And Thessalonica, again, you'll notice a lot of these names are real similar because Paul writes epistles to these churches later. Uh, the, the epistles to the Thessalonians is to the church in Thessalonica. So we see here he comes to Thessalonica where it was a synagogue of the Jews. And I love this statement. Look at verse 2. It says, And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the Scriptures. Now, I, I love the way it says it. Paul had a certain manner about him. Right? It was Paul's manner when he came into the city to go in and to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. He went in and he would preach Jesus. He would go into the synagogues. Any opportunity he had, he would, he would go into the town and he, would, and he was going to preach Jesus Christ. And what I love about that statement, to me it's just so, I mean, it's just a few words. But I want you to think tonight, how is your manner? Right? Everybody's got a manner. Everyone's got a way about them. Right? And I think this is a great attitude that Paul had and just a great manner that he had where he was just, it was just, you look at Paul and be like, yep, that's Paul, that's as his manner. He's going to go in and he's going to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. He's going to go in and he's going to try to show these people, he's going to go and try to show the Jews, he's going to try to show whoever, hey look, Jesus Christ is the Messiah, he's God in the flesh, he came to save the world. And um, is that how your manner is? Or is your manner one of just avoiding talking about Jesus altogether? Right? And again, this is something that, that you ought to think about for yourself. Wouldn't it be great for someone to be speaking about you and say, oh yeah, hey, there's Brother Sebastian, or hey, there's Brother Wayne. Yep, <laughs> there he is. He's preaching the gospel again. That's, his, that's the way his manner is. He's just, he's just like that. He's just one of those guys, he'll go up and just, and just talk to someone on the street and just give him the gospel. And this is the way that Paul's manner was. And I believe this is the way that our manner ought to be too. And you know what? It takes a little bit of time in order for that to be your manner. It means it has to be habitual. I mean, it has to be something that you're kind of known for. It's something that you do regularly, not something that you do once in a blue moon. And, um, you know, it's gonna, it may be hard to start doing that at first, but everyone has to start somewhere. I mean, this church has to start somewhere. You're going out soul winning, preaching the gospel to people has to start somewhere. So you start doing that and make that a goal of yours to say, and whatever, whatever the attribute might be, whatever the great godly attribute that you would like to be known for, just be like, just work on that. I mean, as Paul's manner was, hey, he was opening and alleging that Jesus was Christ. And that's something that we should think about in our own lives. Let's continue reading here, though. Look at verse number three. It says, opening and alleging, this is what he did, this was as his manner, that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus, whom I preach unto you, is Christ. So again, he's opening, he's alleging, he's showing them scriptures, he's reasoning with them, trying to say, look, Here's the evidence from Scripture. Christ fulfilled all these prophecies. This is Christ who came to die for this in the world. Jesus is the Christ that you're looking for. He is the one. That's what he's opening a legend. Verse number four, it says, And some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas, and of the devout Greeks, a great multitude, and of the chief women, not a few. So we see here, He's winning a lot of people to Christ by doing this, too. Obviously, I mean, he's preaching, he's opening a legend, he's saying, Look, this Jesus is the Christ. And it says some of them believed, and they, and they consorted with them, and they, you know, they kind of yoked up with Paul and Silas. And it says of the devout Greeks, a great multitude. So we see here, the great multitude isn't coming from the Jews, it's coming from the Greeks. I mean, it's coming from the Gentiles. They're, they're, seeing, they're, they're receiving his word gladly. It says of the chief word, women, not a few. Let's continue reading in verse 5. It says, but the Jews which believed not moved with envy, took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort and gathered a company and set all the city on an uproar and assaulted the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. So here, and you find this, we find this over and over again throughout the book of Acts, is that there's Jews that believe, there's Gentiles that believe, there's all these different people that, 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 that believe, but they're making a big uproar. They're making a stir. I mean... It's known when, when Paul and Silas and when, when these disciples come into town, I mean, they're really causing an uproar because they're shaking things up. They're getting people to really 
dig into the scriptures and, and look at it closely, and they're, you know, they're upsetting a lot of old traditions. They're upsetting a lot of the, a lot of the churches and, and, and their, their belief systems and, and whatever it is that we go in because they're, they're coming to them with the truth. And they're just preaching the truth, they're preaching Jesus Christ. But what we find here is that specifically is mentioned, the Jews which believe not are the ones that are coming after him the hardest. They're the ones that, for whatever reason, they just can't stand to have Jesus Christ preached. And it says here, like I said, they were moved with envy. They were envious of the fact that, that Paul and Silas were able to, to persuade people and able to get this following and able to get people to believe on Christ. They were envious of that. And see, a lot of these, a lot of these dead churches, a lot of these people that believe that these false doctrine stuff, they may be able to get a crowd together, right? And, and show up every week for service or whatever. But they're not really the powerful leaders generally, by and large, that are really impacting people's lives and really seeing a change and really just, just, just getting through to people to where they become zealous and they want to grow and they want to do more for God. I mean, most of these places... But see, when they see someone else doing that, when they see a great man of God, when they see a leader, and they come in, and they're starting to get people to change their minds, and they're starting to get people to follow them, and they're starting to get people to change their lives and follow Christ and do what it is that they're supposed to do, hey, that's evidence. That's showing people their outward manifestation of their belief, and, and they see what the kind of impact that they're having, and then they become envious. They see that, and they think, man, I, you know, and it just burns them up inside because they're not doing it. They can't do it, but they, they are. And it's coming from someone who believes different, right? Because these the Jews that believe not, they didn't believe in Christ. They believed that the Messiah was still coming. They did not believe in Jesus Christ. They were not saved. So the Jews which believed not, they moved with envy. So what do they end up doing? And a lot of times you'll see this case. It says they took unto them certain lewd fellows of the base or so. So they, they, take, they start going into like the dregs of the city and just kind of pick it up people to to get on board with them against the Christians. So they go to the people who are baser means low. So like base, you think of the base of a building, you know, it's at the it's at the bottom most. So we're talking about the bottom rung type of people. Right? I mean these are people that, you know, they would be your derelicts, your, you know, the people who don't have much character. Who are probably just 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 really into sin and just kind of living a wicked lifestyle. These are people that are of a baser sort. They're lewd fellows, right? They don't have even very much type of a morality. Where I mean, there's, there's a lot of people. Let's face it. There's a lot of people who are religious today that you wouldn't just say that they're just some lewd fellow or some baser sort. I mean, there's people who are generally speaking, of course, we'll say, but generally speaking, pretty good upright people, right? That that want to do right. But they may not be saved. That's not the type of people that, that the Jews took here. It says they went and found the lewd people, the baser sword, just kind of that, 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 that bad element in the, in the city and gathered them a company to set the city on an uproar. So these people are, are easy, easily influenced typically too. And that's, you know, that's exactly what happens in politics too. That's how they get a lot of these, these wicked politicians come into power because what they'll do is they'll gather a lot of the, the people of the baser sort together. They'll make some kind of promise to them and then try to get them together on an uproar to, to cast all these votes in the, to, to bring the, the wickedness in. I mean, that's kind of a side note. It's not exactly what, what, um, what they're talking about here. But, but this is the type of people that the Jews got and moved together with their envy to, to, to attack Paul and Silas. Because that's what they're doing. They're they want to stop them. And their whole goal is to get them to stop their talking, stop their preaching, and stop the impact that they're having in Thessalonica here. Look at verse number 6. It says, And when they found them not, so they didn't find Paul and Silas, but it says they drew Jason and certain brethren unto the rulers of the city, crying, These that have turned the world upside down are come hither also. And man, I love that phrase too. Turn the world upside down. This shows the type of impact that they're having. I mean, they're so upset. They think the whole world's being turned upside down by their doctrine. And you know what? The doctrine of Christ will do that. It's contrary to what the world thinks. The doctrine of Jesus Christ, yeah, that will turn the world upside down. 
It's it's different than what they think. The world the world thinks that you know good is evil and evil is good. And when you when you actually have the truth of God's word, you start preaching that. Hey, that's powerful enough to turn the world upside down. Hey, would to God that that Word of Truth Baptist Church will turn Prescott Valley upside down. That one day we could we could have enough. Bible believing Christians congregating together here where we can go out and we can preach the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ and so much to just say we're turning it upside down with our doctrine. We're, we're confounding these false religions that have, that have dug in here and that are deceiving so many people and that we're going we're gonna to turn this place upside down. We're going to see some great results. We're going to get people living for Christ. We're going we're gonna to make changes in people's lives. And by bringing Jesus Christ to them and helping them to get established and get founded in the truth and get founded in Jesus Christ so that they can get that type of change that we all need. I mean, hey, getting saved is the first step. But the whole goal, we want to transform our lives to be as close to Christ as possible. Yes, we need to go out and get people saved. Absolutely. But let's not stop there. Let's try to work in people's lives and, and care about them and try to get them in and get them in church and get them found and get them grounded in the truth and get them grounded in God's word so that they can start making those necessary changes. And people will look at them and say, hey, you live kind of different. You're kind of peculiar. You're kind of odd. You're a little bit different. Well, the Bible says that, that God's chosen a peculiar people for himself. And that's what we are. If you're, if you're truly living the way that the Bible has laid out for us to live, you are going to look different than the world. You are going to look peculiar in their eyes. And that's the whole goal, is that we want to turn the world upside down with the doctrine of the Bible and get people on board and zealous to serve Christ, get the sin out of their lives, and start doing what is right. Hey, that's going to look different to the world. People are going to look at that, and, and, and if you get enough people following it like they did here, to the point where other people are envious of that, hey, they're getting a good following, they're getting a lot of people together doing this, they're going to turn the world upside down. And would to God that he can use our church to do something similar here in this town. But let's keep reading here. Look at verse number 7. It says, Whom Jason hath received, and these all do contrary to the decrees of, of Caesar, saying that there is another king, one Jesus. Now, the devil's attacks don't change. Okay? He's got the same... They've been doing this for a long time now. First, they're going to lie about you. It's exactly what they did here. Now... Is there anything to show any evidence that Paul and Silas were, were out just breaking the law and doing things contrary to the Roman law? There's, there's nothing in here to show that they were doing anything contrary to the decrees of Caesar. They're just making stuff up. They're, just, they're mad at them because we already saw earlier, they're mad because they're envious of them. They're mad because of what they're doing, the impact that they're having. So what they're going to do, they're going to use the force of government to try to shut them up. They can't shut them up themselves. They can't you know, speak and use their own words to convince the people because they're fighting against the truth of God's word. They're not able to do it. They're envious of them. So what they do, they're going to turn to the government and say, yeah, get these guys arrested. So they're going to make up whatever they want and say, oh, yeah, they're doing contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, one Jesus, when, again, they did the same thing against Jesus Christ. There's the same exact false witnesses that they're bearing against. So now, is Jesus Christ a king? Yeah, of course he is. But... It's not talking about this, you know, in, in the sense that they're talking about here in, this, in the physical realm and stuff like that. And, and they'll, they'll take your beliefs and they'll try to twist them and use them against you. And, um, you know, of course they're, they're going to lie about you and misrepresent you. So you got to be ready and prepared for that. You see it happening, you saw it happen when Jesus Christ got arrested. You see it happen throughout the book of Acts as the apostles are getting arrested, as the disciples are being arrested and persecuted. It's, it's because they're just bringing up lies again against them. Now, if you're living a righteous life and you start living and doing what's right for God, especially if a group or a church starts to do that, the same type of persecution is going to come. The devil wants to stop that. People are going to hear that. People who hate God and hate the truth, they're going to they're gonna be tirelessly striving against you. So we have to understand that this is going to happen. I mean, think about the same method of text. This even happened to Daniel. Remember what happened to Daniel, right? Daniel was an upright man before God. Daniel was above the reproach of his, of his common man. And it got to the point where they were like, I mean, the people, hate, they envied him. The king had lifted him up to a, to a position 
Because he had an excellent spirit, because he had the wisdom of God, because he made wise choices, he was an upright man, he was respectable, he was dependable, he can do all these things. He was a very valuable person to have in charge, and the other people saw that and they envied him. Again, just like we see here, the people in Daniel's day, the other kings, they wanted that spot. They wanted to be where Daniel was, so they devised ways to get to trip him up because they couldn't do it. They looked at him, and everything he was doing, he was above reproach. He wasn't living in a sense. He wasn't a hypocrite. He wasn't out doing, saying one thing and doing another. He wasn't secretly out going out and breaking the laws and just, just causing some kind of you know, uproar for no reason. You know, He wasn't doing these things. He didn't give anyone a reason that they could look at him and say, Oh, see, look, this guy shouldn't be in charge because he's, got, he's doing thus and so. He had none of that. So what they had to do was they had to come up with a way to devise a way to change the law because they knew that the only way that they can get him to, to break any kind of law is if they could catch him obeying God and not the laws that were given. And that's what they had to do. They had to change the law and they said, you know, anyone seeking petition to any God before they come to you, O king, you know, that's a sin. And, and Daniel wasn't going to do that. Because he obeyed the higher powers and the higher authorities, as we all ought to. But the only way that they could find any type of flaw in Daniel was in order to create this bogus law, and to create this law that was going to be contrary to what, to what God's law says. Because, and that's the way that we all ought to be, is have that type of dedication to the Word of God, to where we're not going to, um, we're not going to have a fault in us Unless it's, you know, we're not going to break the law necessarily unless it has to do with, with, um, with disobeying God's laws, you know. I mean, we're supposed to live peaceably with all men. Um, again, it's not like I'm just pro-government. I think that, and I don't think that we're required to obey every single law that's out there. I believe that God is, has ordained in Romans 13 that there's powers to be and that the, the power that's given to the government is for the punishment of evildoers. That's supposed to be the function. That is the, the God-ordained power that God has given to government is to punish the evildoers, punish the ones that are going out and, and, um, and doing evil unto other people where you have victims and, and there's crimes that are being committed. Yeah, it's the government's job to enforce the, the, the punishments at that point. But um, anyways, I'm kind of getting off on a tangent here. The whole point is that you know, Daniel wasn't doing anything wrong. I mean, he was above reproach. He was doing right in the eyes of God and in the eyes of man. They couldn't look at him and find any fault with him. So they had to come up with a way. And this is what's going to happen too. People will lie about you and they're going to try to find fault for you. And that's what, another reason why it's also important that you are living above reproach. Live a life. Hey, don't be living this life where people are going to be able to look at you and, and find you know, all kinds of manner of evil that you're doing to come and accuse you. And it's not going to be false accusation, right? Because that's going to bring a bad testimony of you even just being a Christian. I mean, think about that. People are going to look at you through a microscope. When they know that you're a Christian, when they know you believe the Bible, because what they're doing is they're trying to find some hypocrisy. The people that don't want to believe the Bible, people that don't want to believe in God, they're going to look at you through a microscope and try to find, oh, oh yeah, well, see, you're doing this, and this is wrong, because they don't like their own sin. So they're going to try to project that onto you and be like, oh, well, well, you have no right to say anything to me because you're doing this or that. And whether it's right or wrong, people do that. Now, I know that we're sinners and we're not perfect. Okay, And if they're going to have that type of an attitude, a lot of times there's nothing you can do to get through to them anyways. But we don't want to bring reproach under the name of Christ. So we all ought to be you know, doing our best to make sure we don't have any of that stuff going on. Because we don't want to bring Christ's name down when you're saying, hey, I'm a Christian, but then you're going out and doing whatever wicked sin that you're doing. You know, that, that will bring the name of Christ down. And we ought not to have that type of, um, of a lifestyle at all. But, um, so we see here, you know, they're, they're attacking Paul, they're attacking Silas, they're trying to get him, and they couldn't find him. They're, they're staying with Jason, they're staying with these brethren, they couldn't find him, so then they bring Jason, they bring these other guys up before the government saying, hey, look, these people that turned the world upside down, they've come here also, they're being contrary to Caesar, they're saying there's another king, you know, one Jesus, and this gets the people all upset. Look at verse number um, uh, 7, it says, whom Jason hath received, and he's all, yeah, and look at verse number 8, and they troubled the people and the rulers of the city when they heard these things, and when they had taken security of Jason, and of the other, they let them go. So basically, 
They let Jason and the other guys go out on bail. They take security. They take some and say, okay, well, we're going we're gonna to try you on this and we're going to find out the, the matter. And then they let them go. So Jason goes back and it says in verse 10, it says, And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. So they're saying, okay, look, they're coming down on us real hard. They arrested us. You know, you guys just got to get out of here. So they're like, okay, fine. They leave at night. They kind of sneak away and they go on to Berea. And we see here again, I mean, what's the first thing they do? It says, who coming thither at the end of verse 10, went into the synagogue of the Jews. So they're going, as soon as they come to the next place, they're going to go preach about Jesus. They're going to go preach the, the gospel in the synagogue here. Verse number 11, it says, these were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. This is a much preached on verse for, for great reason, because this is something that... Um, we all ought to be, y'all ought to have that type of a judgment and, and listen when someone's preaching something to you, search the scriptures. They search the scriptures daily. What does that mean? They were in their Bibles every day. They were reading the scriptures every day and they're analyzing is what I'm hearing lining up with what the Bible says. And it said, this was said they were more noble than those in Thessalonica. Those in Thessalonica, now, a lot of those people got saved. No doubt. I mean, it says there was a, there was a multitude of people that believed. But they weren't as noble as those in Berea because... The people of Berea are actually searching the scriptures and, and just verifying and making sure. Now, you can get saved without verifying if you try, if you just say, you know, take it what the person's telling you at face value. If they're, if they're telling you the truth, right, and you're hearing the truth, sure, you can believe that and get saved. But what you ought to do is not just have that type of acceptance with people in general because the only way you're going to know if someone's telling you the truth is if it's in scripture, if it's found in scripture. You need to search scripture together. And again, I mean, I see this all the time. I go out soul winning. And I'll talk to someone, and people will, a lot of people will be pretty easily receptive. And again, there's, you know, it's not that it's, if they're believing the truth, then amen. But there's a lot of people out there that can be swayed easily because they kind of have this overall acceptance of what they hear. If someone comes to them who seems to be an authority, it doesn't even matter what the topic is. I mean, a lot of people are kind of like that in general. People are, are, tend to be very accepting of the things that they hear, especially when it comes from a so-called authority figure, right? I mean, people turn on the TV, you turn on the news, and they, they hear something, and, and this is what's going on, politics or whatever, and they just kind of have this, this blind faith to just accept what they're hearing. It's just, well, that's the truth, and that's what's coming to them. Instead of being more critical and thinking, well, no, is this really true? And, and a lot of, I think one of the reasons why people don't like doing that is because it takes a little bit of effort, <laughs> It takes a little bit of work to do some fact-checking and go back and research and say, no, is this really true? Or am I just being lied to you? You know, is someone lying to me or, or are they telling me the truth? And they were noble because they searched the scripture daily. And that's something you ought to do. Hey, every time you come to church, every time you hear a preacher or whatever, make sure what they're saying is in scripture. No, would to God, I hope that everything that I preach is coming from the scripture. I mean, that's my goal. That's what I'm trying to do here. But I'm human and I make mistakes too. Okay, I can't say and make a promise that, that I'll never say anything that's incorrect from the Bible. That's why it's your job, sitting in the pew, to, 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 to search the scriptures daily. Be more noble than the rest of the Christians out there. Search the scriptures daily, whether these things are true. And look at the result of that. It says in verse 12, it says, Therefore, meaning because of this, because they search the scriptures daily, whether those things are so, therefore many of them believed, also of honorable women which were Greeks, and of men, not a few, so because they searched the scripture, because they saw this, hey, they matched up. Is what's being preached to me from the Bible? Yes, it is. That's what they found out. So many of them believe. And if you do, if you look at it and say, hey, you know, Pastor Burson's preached something, and maybe you don't believe that right away. Okay, there's nothing wrong with that. Well, then go search the scriptures and then decide for yourself, was he saying the truth or was he not based on what the Bible says, based on what God's word says, because that is the ultimate final authority that we should have for our faith. Let's continue on here. It says um, in verse 13, it says, But when the Jews of Thessalonica had knowledge that the word of God was preached to Paul at Berea, they came thither also and stirred up the people. Man, these people just will stop at nothing. They're relentless. And we saw this previously in the other book of Acts where they're not even, they're not even satisfied with stopping them in their own town. I mean, they were in Thessalonica. They kicked them out of Thessalonica. They had, they had to flee. They had to get away. 
Now they're coming to Berea and chasing after them because they're preaching the word of God there. And here's the thing. You may switch locations. You may get a reprieve from that assault. But it'll come again. Okay, and just be ready for that. It's not something you might, you might face persecution for preaching the word of God. You have to stay vigilant. You have to stay steadfast. The Bible says resist the devil and he will flee from you. But it doesn't say he's not going to come back again. You need to be strong in the faith. Do what you need to do. Preach the word. Hey, the attacks are going to come and then they might go away, but don't think that they won't come back again. If you continue preaching the word, the attacks will come back again. And this is what happened here with Paul and Silas is that they, they found out about it. They're like, we're going to go stop them over there and they will stop another. And this is that type of attitude that the God haters have, the people who just will stop at nothing, that they have that type of a heart where they just they don't want anyone to hear the gospel. And, uh, and it's wickedness. But let's, uh, let's keep reading here. And it says uh, in verse 14, And then immediately the brethren sent away Paul to go as it were to the sea. But Silas and Timothy and both themselves so said, Okay, Paul, why don't you just get out of here? But Silas and, and Timothy stayed there. They stayed in, um, in Berea. And then it says, And they, they that conducted Paul brought him unto Athens, and receiving a commandment unto Silas and Timotheus for to come to him with all speed, they departed. So Silas and Timotheus stay in Berea. They send Paul to Athens. Paul gets to Athens, and then he sends a commandment. He says, hey, I need you guys here with me, so come, so come back with me. So now he's waiting for, for, um, for Silas and Timothy to come to him. And in verse 16, we see now while, while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Again, Earlier we saw Paul as his manner was. He goes into the synagogue and he's preaching the gospel. Well here, man, he can't sit still. His spirit is stirred within him. And again, think about this. This is something that we ought to have within ourselves. Our spirit ought to be stirred up. When you're around a bunch of unbelievers, when you see all this stuff going on and people are just deceived by this false religion, you know, they just had idolatry. They had all these false gods in, in Greece and Athens here. They, they had all this host, all these various gods that they worshipped and that they believed in. They, um, Paul's spirit was stirred. He couldn't just sit by and just, just say, oh yeah, well, yeah, these people all just believe something different. They don't believe in Christ and, and whatever. I'm just going to go see the sights. Right? He's not like, well, I'm, I'm waiting for, as long as I'm waiting for, for Silas and Timothy, I'm just going to go and, and, and go to the zoo and check out whatever things they have here. He sees this, the, the city wholly given to idolatry. And his spirit is stirred inside him, and he needs to take action on this. It says in, um, it says, therefore, verse 17, so because his spirit was stirred, therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met him. So look at all the different places he's going. I mean, he's disputing in the synagogue with the Jews. And with the devout persons, the people who are, who are devoted to, to their false religion, the devout persons, and in the market daily with them that met with him. So he's not only going to synagogue, I mean, he's, he's all over the place. I mean, he's in the market, he's talking to people there, he's talking to people who are real devout, he's talking to the Jews, and he's disputing with them and basically just preaching the gospel unto them. And then, um, I, I forgot to mention something, need, we need to backtrack a little bit. We're going to get right back into the story in just a minute, but I wanted to... to to hit on something a little bit more about the people, the people of Berea that search the scriptures daily. Because I, I kind of skipped over this point in my sermon. I don't, I don't want to leave it out. 2 Timothy chapter 2 says in verse 14, it says, Of these things put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So this is something that we're exhorted to do. You know, when you search the scriptures daily, trying to determine if these things are so, it says that, um, you know, you're not supposed to be striving with people about words to no profit. Because there's going to be people out there that try to get you into these arguments, and these vain arguments, and these basically just stupid arguments, and they're going to waste a ton of your time. Where there's vain arguments that, that are... Um, strife about words to no profit, but that basically what they're doing is this subverting of the hearer. So it's just trying to subvert your faith. People are just out there, they have these weird false doctrines, but it says that you need to study to show thyself approved unto God. 
And I mentioned this in an earlier sermon. You know, we're not studying to show ourselves approved unto men, but approved unto God. God will know how much studying you're doing. God will be able to approve. Are you, are you reading the Bible enough? Are you memorizing enough? Are you studying enough? God is the one that you need to be worried about of being approved unto. And then it says, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Hey, workman means you're doing work. It's not easy. It's not just something that, oh, when I get some free time and I'm going to lounge here and I'm just going to read a little bit of the Bible and close it. That's not a workman. You're putting forth some time. You're studying to show yourself approved. I mean, when you go, when I remember being in school, we have homework. That was work. I mean, you had to go and take some time and study and learn and do all this stuff. Hey, you need to be treating the Bible the same way. You need to be treating God's word the same way. Study the Bible. Learn it. Look at it. And it ought not to be a chore, but something that you actually love. I mean, there's certain subjects oftentimes that, that people like more than others. So when they have to do the homework on the one thing, it's not that big of a deal because they're enjoying doing it, right? Whatever it is that they're interested in. Well, hopefully you're interested in the Bible so that you want to study, you want to learn more about God's Word, and then it won't be a drudgery for you. And it's something that, that yes, you're working for it. It's hard work to do it, but it's something that you can enjoy in the meantime. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 2.16, also just continuing on, it says, But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. And it says, um, And their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already and overthrow the faith of some. So he's saying the sh the, to shun profane and vain babblings. Right? People are going to have these weird, bizarre doctrines. They're just vain babblings. They're profane against the word of God, against the truth. It says they're just going to increase unto more ungodliness. And he, he calls out two people. He says, and the word will eat as doth a canker of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus. So he's saying, he's naming two false prophets by name. He's, he's naming Hymenaeus and Philetus. And there's a lot of people today who will be like, oh, you know, you shouldn't, you shouldn't name out people who have this type of false doctrine. It's like, no, Paul did it. Okay, and it's not just someone, oh, they're a little bit off on this or a little bit off on that. These are people who are, who are false prophets. They had profane and vain babblings. And what they were doing, it says, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already. They're saying that, that these people were teaching that, well, the resurrection already happened. The resurrection of that, that, that has not happened yet. It's coming in the future. It says, and overthrow the faith of some. So by their damnable heresy of just saying, oh, the resurrection already happened, they were overthrowing people's faith. And um, so then we, we're going to pick back up here. It says in verse 16, we're, we're kind of back, backtracking a little bit because there's another verse that I, that I kind of skipped over. I meant to, to say a little bit more on. Um, you know, his, Paul's spirit stirred within him. He saw the city given to idolatry. Verse number 17, it says, Therefore disputed he in the synagogue and with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met with them. Now notice here, this is something that he's doing every day. He's a, it's not just even once a week. I mean, now, Paul had given himself wholly unto the ministry of the Word, right? He was an evangelist, and he was, he was doing this. He was being supported oftentimes with what he was doing. But it's still something he didn't, he didn't let up with this. He saw the, the city given idolatry. His spirit was stirred. He goes out. He's in a synagogue. He's in a devout person. He's in the market, and he's disputing with the people and just trying to convince and persuade people to believe on Jesus Christ. Let's keep reading. It says, Then certain of the... Of the philosophers of the Epicureans of the Stoics encountered him and some said what will this babbler say other some he seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection so these people are thinking like well what kind of God is he preaching they just think it's kind of weird they think it's strange now they had their Greek gods back then right all these different various gods the, you know, Ares, and, and I don't know, I, I always get the Roman gods and the Greek gods confused. It's something we had to learn in school way back when. But um, these mythological gods, these fake gods that they worshipped. Well, Paul comes in and he's preaching about Jesus Christ and his resurrection from the dead, coming back from the dead. And they're thinking, whoa, what kind of strange gods are you preaching to us? Right? Someone dying and coming back to life? So they take him, verse 19, it says, and they took him and brought him unto Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is. We want to know about this. Tell us, tell us more about this. Right? Verse 20. For thou bringest certain strange things to our ears. We would know, therefore, what these things mean. Verse 21. For all the Athenians and strangers 
which were there, spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. So it was the trendy thing back then to just to talk about and just to hear and to, and to know some new thing, whatever the news is, right? What's, we want to know what's new. We want to know the latest and greatest. What do you got for us? You know, we, we want to hear about it. We want to talk about it and everything. Else. Like that was just, that was their, the, the trendy thing back then in, in Athens. It was that they spent their time and nothing like that's where they devoted all their time. It's just, oh, wow, you got some new doctrine. Let's hear it. You got some new God. Let's hear about it. This is what we want to hear about. This is what we want to talk about. Verse number 22 says, Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. So then, look, you guys are too superstitious. You got all these gods, right? Verse 23, it says, For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, right? these devotions, these statues, right? These, these altars or whatever, made up to all these different false gods and all these devotions, it says, I found an altar with this inscription, to the unknown god. So they have all these different gods, right? They have, I'm sure, statues of all these fake gods, like phony gods. And just in case they missed one, they even made one that says to the unknown god, right? Because they have all these various gods, and the god of the sun, and the god of the earth, and the god of water, and god of, you know, god of all these different things, right? God of lightning, god of all these different gods. And they're like, well, just in case we forget one, let's build this altar unto the unknown god, right? Let's just make sure we got all our bases covered in case we forgot one. Hey, here's one to the unknown god. So Paul's like, you guys are way too superstitious. But he points that out, and he usually says, okay, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship. I mean, you don't even know who he is. You're ignorant. He says, him declare I unto you. Because out of all of them, he's just going to say, okay, look, I'm going to preach unto you the real God, and he's unknown to you, so I'm going to tell you all about him, right? And he starts preaching to him here in verse 24. It says, God that made the world and all things therein, Seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worship with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. So he's saying, look, you got all these idols, like the God of heaven... He doesn't dwell in temples made with hands. So these, these temples and these dedications and these things that you're building, like, he doesn't exist and he doesn't live there. Like, that's not, you're not building a habitation for him. He's boundless. He's, you know, God is, is omnipresent. God is everywhere. He can't be con contained in these little things. And it says, neither is worship with men's hands as though he needed anything. It's not like you need to minister unto God because God needs something from you. Right? A lot of these people had these, because these fake gods, they were not all powerful that they worshiped. They thought that they were, they were helping out their gods and doing things for their gods. And he's saying, look, the true God, the real God, the God that you guys don't even know about, he doesn't need any of this stuff. He's beyond you. He's the one actually that gives you your life and your breath. And he gives you rain and he gives you all these things. He doesn't need this. And I like this verse here because it says in verse 26, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth. And... A lot of people need to understand this because this is where this is this people who are essentially the racist they don't get this they don't understand that God there's there's you know essentially there's one race we got the human race okay the color of your skin means nothing who your descendants are means nothing God has made us all one blood we all have that connection we're all children in the sense where we're, we're you know interrelated to the sense that we're all made of one blood and as he was here, he's, you know, we, we read earlier that we need to shun profane and vain babblings. And I just want to hit real quick on, on this one strange doctrine that's going around today. And a lot of people get sucked into these bizarre doctrines. But there's this one that says that, like, uh, and I was just talking to a guy last week about it, too. He was saying that, um, that somehow there's, there's people that live that are not... <laughs> What did he say? He's basically, that like devils like have mingled their seed in with with the human race, and he said that um, Cain was not a son of Adam, is what he said. Cain who slew Abel, he said he was not a son of Adam because it says in Jude that he was of that wicked one. 
So he said, oh, see, he was of that wicked one, meaning that like somehow the devil spawned him like physically. And he wasn't understanding the fact that I tried to explain it to him. Like, look, the Bible talks about people who are children of the devil. Let's talk about spiritually. Let's not talk about physically. It's not about physically born of like devils and stuff like that. It's this weird doctrine. And um, so then I asked him, I was like, well, you know, do you believe that like we all came from, from Adam and Eve? Like essentially, like are we all originally from? He said, no. I said, well, what about, what about Noah, right? I mean, the Bible is clear about that. Do you believe that the flood covered the entire earth? And he said, no. He said, he said, there's no way. And this is the thing. See, people get so wrapped up in these weird, bizarre doctrines and, and reading commentaries and reading all these other things. If you just read the Bible for yourself, I'm going to destroy that real briefly here. Now, I already preached a sermon on the worldwide flood. But Genesis 9.19 says, these are the three sons of Noah, and of them was the whole earth overspread. By Noah's sons, everybody that we have that are alive today came from them. The whole earth was overspread by them. And, of course, they came from Noah and his wife, which, you go back through the genealogies, came from Adam and Eve. That's at, you know, God created Adam out of the dust. He didn't start creating a bunch of other people out of the dust. He created Adam and Eve. They had children, and their children had children, and they, you know, and they married and, and, and did all that. And then when God sent the flood, he wiped everybody out. So, again, we can all trace back to Noah because he was, his family was all that was left alive on the earth. And the Bible is very clear about that. It says in Genesis 6, 17, it says, And behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, wherein is the breath of life from under heaven, and everything that is in the earth shall die. That's what God said that he was going to do when he brought the flood in, that everything on the earth is going to die. Everything. And it says, from under heaven. It's not talking about some small geographic location where man was living in that area. He said everything under heaven, which, which encompasses the entire globe, and everything that is in the earth shall die. Everything. And you can't get much more clear than this. In Genesis 7, 19, it says, And the waters prevailed exceedingly upon the earth, and all the high hills that were under the whole heaven were covered. Underneath the whole heaven. Not in one location. All of the high hills that are in the whole heaven were covered. You couldn't see them. It says, 15 cubits upward did the waters prevail and the mountains were covered. So it's not just even high hills. I mean, this is talking about the mountains. And I'll tell you what, once water starts going over a mountain, it's going to keep going over, the, over to the other end. And if the mountain's covered, there's nowhere left for that water to go. The water covered the entire earth. It says, and all flesh died that moved upon the earth, both of fowl, and of cattle, and of beast, and of every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth, and every man. He lists off just about everything. He said, look, everything died. Now, if you don't want to believe that all flesh died, if you don't want to believe that all men died in the flood, then you don't believe the Bible. It's just plain and simple. If you don't want to believe that that happened, you simply do not believe the words that God wrote in this book for us, to live, to live by and to give for us as truth today. Genesis 7, 22 says, All in whose nostrils was the breath of life, and of all that was in the dry land died, and every living substance was destroyed, which was upon the face of the ground, both man and cattle and the creeping things and the fowl of the heaven, and they were destroyed from the earth, and Noah only remained alive, and they that were with him in the ark. You can't get much more clear than that. He said, Everything was wiped out, and Noah and, the, and whatever was in the ark with him, that's all that remained alive. Everything else was dead. Yet people come up with this bizarre doctrine still. And I don't understand. Where, how, can you, you, how can you look at the Bible and read this and still say, well, no, no, not everyone died in the flood. To me, you just got the veil over your face and you're not saved if you're going to believe something that contrary to what the Bible just, just blatantly says. And you know what? They'll try to, you know, these people with these false doctrines, they'll try to twist you around and they'll take a few verses, but that's why you have to search the scriptures daily. Because a lot of deceivers are out there and they're going to pull out this verse here, this verse here, and this verse here. And they're going to try to lead you down their twisted path and say, see? See, look, Cain was of that wicked one. He wasn't really a son of Adam. And they'll just show you a couple of verses. Well, no, 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 well, wait a minute. That doesn't make any sense because... I've read the Bible and I know that this, 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 you know, 
You need to be able to have that type of an understanding so you don't get twisted around and you don't get deceived by these people with these false doctrines. And the Bible says right here that God has made the whole world, um, that God has made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the earth. We're all of one blood. We're not of mixed blood with some spiritual beings that are neither given, they're married nor given in marriage, but they're spirits and they're ministering spirits. I mean, the Bible talks about angels that are they're ministering spirits. They're not flesh and blood. They're not, you know, they're not married or given in marriage. They're not mingling their seed with the human race somehow. God's made us all of one blood. But um, let's move on from that. I just kind of wanted to point that out because, um, you know, you come across this stuff and, and, it's, and it's hard to even believe that people believe it, but it's out there. Um, and I just dealt with it a few days ago. But let's continue on here. I think we left off in verse 26, so let's look at verse 27. That they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring, verse 29, for as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone, graven by our man's device. So again, just pointing out their idolatry and saying, look, don't think that the Godhead is like gold or silver, so, you know, these things that you make with your hands. God is way above that. Verse 30, it says, In the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, in that he hath raised him from the dead. See, judgment's coming. And Paul is preaching this unto them, saying, Look, you need to forsake this idolatry. Forsake these false gods. They can't save you. This is just work of man's hands. You know, God is greater than all of this. And the same man that I'm preaching about, the same man, Jesus Christ, who was raised from the dead, who came back to life, who died for your sins, he's going to come back in judgment. That's why you need to repent. Get rid of these stupid idols. Stop worshiping them. Worship and serve the true living God. Worship and serve Jesus Christ. Because he's going to come back, and he's going to come back with vengeance. See, well, the first time that Jesus Christ came, it was in love. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. The Bible says in verse uh, John 3, 17, it says, For God, for God sent his Son not into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Jesus didn't come to condemn. He came humble. He came meek. He came as a minister. He came as a servant. He came to give his life for the world, for everybody. That was the first time he came. Extreme love to open up and to give us that opportunity to believe on him. But I'll tell you what, the second time he comes back, it's not going to be the same. He's not coming back as the servant. He's coming back as the king. He's coming back and he's going to set up his kingdom on this earth. And he's going to judge. He's going to judge righteous judgment. And there's going to be a lot of things that are going to be set right with God when God pours out his wrath on this earth. He said that day of judgment is going to be coming. You need to repent. You need to get right with God. Get rid of these stupid idols and start worshiping and serving the true and, and, and the real God. And that's the message that he was given to him. And it's the same message for us today because those end times are coming. They're way closer now than they were back then. Um, let's continue reading. We're almost done here. We've got a few more verses left. It says in verse 32, And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead... Some mocked, and others said, We will hear thee again of this matter. So Paul departed from among them, howbeit certain men clave unto him and believed, among the which was Dionysius the area of Apagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. And I'm going to close with this. Basically, this is how it is when you go out soul. This is very typical when you go out souling. You preach to gospel people. Some people are going to mock you. They're going to ridicule you and say, Oh, you believe that bug. You believe that, you know... That, that's, that's just man's words. You, I can't believe you believe that fairy tale. You probably believe in unicorns and rainbows too, right? And they'll mock you and ridicule you and make fun of you and say, oh yeah, you believe that nonsense, that old book. <coughs> Some people are going to do that. Whatever. Shake off the dust of your feet against them. They're ignorant. They don't know the truth. They need to repent because the day is coming. But others are going to say, hey, I'll well, hear you again about this. They may be open about it, but they also might not get saved right then and there, right? They're, they're, they're not rejecting it. They're not mocking you. They'll hear it and say, okay, well, I need to hear it again. And you know, a lot of people are like that. Before they get saved, 
They need to hear the gospel more than one time. They might need to hear it over and over again. They might need to hear it multiple times in order for it to get through them, in order to sink in. But they're going to hear us again, that matter. And then it says, how be it certain men clave unto him and believe. And then you're going to get people who do believe. It's going to happen. All three of these things are going to happen when you go out and preach Jesus Christ. It happens every single time. Don't get discouraged because you're getting mocked. Don't get discouraged because some people don't believe and they're just like, oh, well, I'm going to need, I'm going to, need to hear this again. Because no matter what, when you go out, the Bible says that he that goeth out and preach the word, you know, and um, oh, I'm just totally messing this up. You're doubtless going to come again rejoicing, bringing your sheaves with you. When you go out and plant the seed, when you sow the seed of God's word, you're going to rejoice. It will, it will bring forth fruit. You might not see it right away. You're never doing it in vain when you're preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Don't let these things get you down. I mean, it, it, Paul dealt with it. It was a normal occurrence. You might get mocked. You might get ridiculed. You might have people coming after you and trying to shut you up and trying to get you to stop preaching the word of God. Stay faithful to God. Keep at it. Keep diligent. Don't worry about what men can do unto you. And, um, and it's all about, I mean, about three times, at least in this one chapter, we see the Bible recording that people believed, put their faith on Christ based on what Paul was preaching to them. We saw it in Thessalonica. We saw it in Berea. And we saw it here in Athens. In all three places, Paul might have gotten mocked, ridiculed, persecuted. But in all three places, people were getting saved. Praise God for that. And, and that happened as a result of a man who's willing to give up his life and just say, you know what, I'm going to do what you have for me to do. So let's all try to have that attitude. Let's all have that attitude of, of you know, here am I, Lord, send me. And as your manner is, ought to be one that goes out and preaches the gospel of Jesus Christ. And let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for this book. I thank you for the book of Acts. I thank you for the great examples that we have in Paul and Silas and Timotheus and Barnabas and all the other great men of God, dear God, that we've been reading about in the book of Acts. I pray that you would please help us to make a habit out of soul winning and make a habit out of preaching Christ uh, to anyone that we come in, in contact with, like Paul did daily in the marketplace and just going around and talking to devout people and anyone, whoever we come into contact with, dear God, help us always to use that as an opportunity to preach the gospel. And yeah, we may be mocked. Yeah, we may be ridiculed, dear Lord. Um, people may not get saved uh, that day, but Lord, help us to stay faithful because we know that if we keep at it, continue, some people are going to hear and some people are going to believe. And Lord, it's all worth it for those, for those souls whose eternity is changed forever. Lord, we love you. And we thank you for your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.